God used to dwell in a house among his people. But now he has a home that's better than the first. It doesn't look like a building with a steeple. Now he's living in the people of the church. Brick after brick, God is building his temple. Brick after brick, he's making it strong. With Christ the sure foundation and his people as the stones, he is building a place he can live. Brick after brick. Good morning, friends. How are we doing? Are we excited to be here? I know I am. I don't care what the weather's doing. I don't care what the world is all about right now. I don't care what's happening here, there, and everywhere. We're still here. We're still going. And God is still on the throne. Amen? All right. So we're taking our lesson today from the Gospel of John, chapter 11, calling this Unbound. We'll be talking about a very familiar character from the Bible, Lazarus. Our key verses are here. When he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. And the man who had died came out, his hands and feet bound with linen strips, and his face wrapped with a cloth. Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. Unbind him and let him go. This is going to be the focus of our message today. Now, Lazarus is an interesting character. The Greek Orthodox Church has kind of a special designation for him. They call him Righteous Lazarus. I'm not sure um, why the difference is. There's sort of a parallel to the Catholic Church, and I don't remember that in the Catholic Church. So the Eastern Church apparently has a little more of a, a special place for Lazarus. So I thought that was interesting to know. Well, another thing that's interesting is that he never speaks in Scripture. And it's interesting because Jesus obviously knew him well. In fact, he's called our friend here in the Scripture. So you'd almost logically think you'd hear from him at some point. But the Bible does everything with a purpose. To know what's important about Lazarus, there was really no need to actually hear anything from Lazarus, as we find out. His name means God has helped, or the God of help. That's a great name to have when you look at it that way. Like, yeah, that's what God is all about, helping us along. So this was an occasion where there was quite a few sad people there, Lazarus' immediate family, plus a bunch of other Jewish folks who had come along to support them. So a sad day indeed. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled. And he said, where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. So the Jews said, see how he loved him. I want to talk about this a little bit. This is logically, we say, well, he was Jesus's friend. He was sad to see him go. He felt badly for his surviving relatives. But is it that simple? We're going to look at that a little more closely. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled. That appears to reinforce that, doesn't it? But it doesn't. The phrase deeply moved here is also can translated as indignant. It's from the Greek root primarily signifying to snort with anger as of horses, to be painfully moved. Well, that doesn't sound like someone who's sad and depressed. It sounds like someone who's ticked off. Troubled. It means stirred or agitated, as in roiling water. When you go to the ocean, and it's a stormy day, and the ocean's looking angry. This is what we're talking about here. Well, what has this got to do with grieving over a friend? In fact, these people had no understanding of just how Jesus loved him, and just how much Jesus loved him, and them as well. Jesus says the following in verses 11 through 15, Our friend, there's that word, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I go to awaken him. The disciples said to him, Lord, if he's fallen asleep, he will recover. These guys could be so dense, right? Now Jesus had spoken of his death, but they thought he meant taking rest and sleep. Then Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus has died, and for your sake I'm glad that I was not there so that you may believe, but let us go to him. This is a real, something that really stood out for me. Lazarus has died, and for your sake, I'm glad I wasn't there. They're like, you're the great healer. You're at the point in your ministry where you've done all kinds of healings and stuff, and people have been brought back from the dead and all, and you're saying you're glad that we're supposed to feel better now because you weren't there. So, of course, then we're going to understand that. 
so what is he, what is the point? What does he want them to believe? What he wants them to believe is what he says to Martha. Verse 25 and 26, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. And isn't that the key to the Christian faith? Everyone who lives and believes in Jesus Christ shall never die. In John 3.16, now granted, these people didn't have these scriptures, but it's great for our understanding now looking back. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. The other way this phrase is rendered, this is the way God loved the world. So in other words, in this manner, this is how he did it. Is it a tremendous amount of love? Sure, but if you want to be a little more exact with how it's translated, it's talking about he decided to do it this way, as opposed to any other way he could have done it. Why? Because for the wages of sin is death, and the free gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. And because without faith it is impossible to please him, that whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. Makes more sense when we look at it that way, doesn't it? Thinking about the destruction of Jerusalem that was to come before much longer. Jesus, of course, anticipated this. And we see that that Jesus wept again. When he drew near and saw the city, Jerusalem, he wept over it, saying, Would that you, even you, had known on this day the things that make for peace. But now they're hidden from your eyes. For the days will come upon you, is this event, when your enemies will set up a barricade around you and surround you and hem you in on every side and tear you down to the ground, you and your children within you. And they will not leave one stone upon another in you because you did not know the time of your visitation. And that's the point. You didn't get it when Christ came down and stood among you. When salvation was at hand. So notice, getting back to Lazarus again, down to verse 37. But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man also have kept this man from dying? So Jesus deeply moved again. He's like, see? Came to the tomb. So this is what was bothering Jesus. He wasn't mourning the death of Lazarus. He knew he'd be bringing him back from the grave shortly. That wasn't going to be a problem. The sadness his family and friends felt was going to be very short-lived. He was indeed upset and disturbed by the unbelief surrounding him. That's what made him feel like roiling water. Jesus was mourning over the world's sinful condition. Of course, Jesus is not surprised by anything, but I think about the world's sinful condition then. And boy, it just seems like over the years, it's just been a downward spiral. It's just crazier and crazier and crazier. And evil has more and more and more of a hold. Which is why, of course, we know he's going to come back and settle us all one day soon. So, back to the immediate situation. It was a cave and a stone lay against it. Jesus said, take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, by this time there will be an odor, for he's been dead four days. (laughs) Kind of understand you're saying that. And the four days, by the way, is also intentional. The Jews had sort of a, a superstitious belief that within the first three days, your soul might still be poking around. It was almost like you weren't quite gone yet. So you notice Jesus just takes that out of the picture by waiting a little bit longer. So no one can turn around later and say, oh, well, Lazarus wasn't really gone yet. He just kind of came back. Jesus said to her, and here's the real point of all of this. Did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? That's what this whole story is about glory of God. There was a cave and a stone lay against it. Jesus said, take away the stone. I'm wondering how many of the people that were there that day said, number one, what in the world are you talking about? Why would we want to do that? And number two, who do you think you are to tell us to take the stone away? You're not the boss of me. And why would I want to do something like that in the first place? There's nothing in the scripture to indicate that anybody gave him any argument. In fact, what they did was they took away the stone. Jewish law, in fact, would have forbade the removal of the stone, but his order superseded it, and it got done. This gave them an opportunity to see Lazarus for themselves before Jesus called him out. No excuses. Don't try to say that he wasn't in there, because you'll be able to go in there. You'll see him for yourself. Now, moving the stone really was unnecessary for the display of God's power and glory, wasn't it? Couldn't he just brought Lazarus right through the wall if he wanted to? Of course he could. 
He decided to do it that way. And one of the reasons is because Jesus liked to involve people. Imagine if you were there that day. You were one of the people who were involved in this operation. And you go, yeah, man, I was there that day. I was one of the guys that rolled that stone back. And, man, that guy came out. I was there. I, I, I was with, we, The stone was in it, man. We had to move. It was heavy. We got it out of the way. I was there. I got to be part of what Jesus did. I, I kind of helped him out. I did, you know, I moved the, moved the stone out of the way for him. Did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? Yeah. That's what I'm talking about. Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you've heard me. I know that you always hear me. But I said this on account of the people standing around, knowing what's going on in all their heads, right? That they may believe that you sent me. That they may believe that you sent me. That they may see the glory of God and believe in Jesus Christ. So let's talk a little bit about the command of Jesus. Jesus didn't ask anybody, hey, one of you guys want to help me out with, with this stone over here? He didn't ask anybody anything. He was large and in charge. He cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. And the man who had died came out. Why? Because Jesus said so. He said, come out, and he came out. Imagine being there that day and seeing that. The command of Jesus. In Mark, we see that he awoke and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, peace be still, and the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. The wind ceased, and there was a great calm. Why? Because Jesus said so. Because he's in control of everything. Because he is all-powerful. Because he has everything in hand. So he said, calm down, and everything calmed down. In Matthew, when he's being tested by Satan, when he had enough, he said, Then Jesus said to him, Be gone, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. Then the devil left him, and behold, angels came and were ministering to him. He said, Be gone, and the devil left him. Why? Because he said, I've had enough out of you. Get lost. Your time is up. What would it have been like to be Lazarus? You're in what they would call at the time Abraham's bosom. You're in the good place. You don't hurt anymore. You're not suffering anymore. You're blissful. You're happy. You're joyful. And then suddenly, what happened next? Did the Lord or an angel or whoever tell him, hey, you know, we got to send you back for a bit? <laughs> or did he just wake up? Can't see, can't move, but all I know is I've got to go. So he gets up and struggles his way out. And he's still in all this stuff. He must be like, what is going on? Where am I? What, what's happening? I, just, I never really thought about it that much before, but this, if he wasn't told in advance that he was coming back, what an experience would that have been? But I'll tell you what, either way, once they took that cloth off his face and he looked out and saw his friend Jesus, I bet he knew what was going on then. Wow. Amazing. So Lazarus was changed forever. You don't remain the same after an experience like that, I'm pretty sure. He was one of these characters in the Bible who was specially blessed. We have people who are blessed a variety of ways. But in this case, you know how certain people like, for example, Mary got to bear the human Jesus into the world. So not only are you blessed, that's pretty special. Well, Lazarus, this whole bit of coming out of the tomb and everything, this is a little more than your average miracle, isn't it? This is pretty special too. Lazarus is famous. His name is used for a variety of reasons, even by secular folks. So this was really particularly specially blessed. I'm going to bring you back because you know how we always say, like, if you're still here, God's not done with you yet. So he came back because God wasn't done with him yet. He had a role for him to play. That role was to be a walking testimony of Jesus everywhere this guy went. That's that guy. He was dead. My cousin was there that day. He was one of the stone guys. Man, that's the guy. However, Lazarus, instead of being your average guy, was now a polarizing figure, just like Jesus, and because of Jesus. That probably wasn't a role that he was so happy about. Six days before the Passover, Jesus therefore came to Bethany, where Lazarus was, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. So they gave a dinner for him there. Martha served, and Lazarus was one of those reclining with him at table. 
So in some ways, it was kind of back to business for their family. But certainly, everybody sitting there knew it can never be like it was. Well, because of this, when the large crowd of the Jews learned that Jesus was there, they came not only in account of him, but also to see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. So the chief priests made plans to put Lazarus to death as well, because on account of him, many of the Jews were going away and believing in Jesus. They wanted to kill him now as well. We can't leave any loose ends, boys. We get Jesus, we're going to get this guy too. We don't want him walking around. This is the part where you say, well, how stupid can you possibly be? But it's not a matter of intelligence. It's a matter of spiritual blindness. We wonder sometimes how people can be so spiritually blind to the truth of the gospel. Well, he was walking around among these guys, and they still didn't get it. God hasn't touched your heart and opened your eyes to be able to receive the truth of the gospel. It's not going to happen. So we never know who that's going to be from day to day. Our job is just to be obedient and proclaim his name and leave the rest to God. God is the one who does it. We don't do anything. We just get to be like one of the stone guys. He's, we get involved. Jesus involves us in what he does. So, of course, these guys are after him, trying to figure out how they're going to get him, trying to figure out how they're going to take Lazarus out as well. I used to say this about some of these more clever criminal justice systems. I'm like, if they spent all that time and energy doing something constructive, wouldn't the world be a better place? You could say the same thing about these guys. All that time and energy, if they could have spent it better, would have had a lot better result. Lazarus got to be part of a mighty miracle, which demonstrated God's power, coming literally from death to life. But there's a greater miracle than that. Coming from eternal condemnation to eternal life with our Savior, Jesus Christ. Remember in the Bible where Jesus says, you guys will do greater miracles than me, and they're scratching their heads. Like, how could we do something greater? Because when they passed on his word, he would do a mighty work in their souls, and they become saved and pass from spiritual death to spiritual life. That's the greater miracle. So the life of Lazarus would certainly never be the same. Well, neither should ours. As a member of God's family, you should never feel the same. What could possibly be a bigger change in your life? What could possibly be more important? Our Savior Christ Jesus, who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel, because he did it the hard way. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. First Peter. So two things, dying to sin. We can die to sin because, like Lazarus, we're now unbound. We're freed from the pain of sin. We're freed from that guilt. We've been declared innocent. We're freed from the penalty of sin, from the separation of God, from that condemnation that would keep us away from him forever, keep us in torment rather than joy forever. And we're freed from the power of sin in our daily lives. It's still there crouching at the door trying to get us, isn't it? But we now have a choice. And it's still a difficult choice by nature for us to make very often. But at least now we can. So to die to sin, the next step is to live to righteousness. Now here's the important part for us day to day going forward. As you come to him, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God chosen and precious. You yourselves like living stones are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. And I love the way this particular translation says this. This is the only one I found that says it exactly this way. For it stands in Scripture. God's Word stands. God's Word stands, and we stand on it. Because we stand on the rock that's Christ. Behold, I'm laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone chosen and precious. And whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. So the honor is for you who believe. But for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone, and a stone of stumbling, and a rock of offense. That rock that we stand on is the rock that the unbeliever trips over. You yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood. This is called the brick church. It's literally made out of bricks. But is that the church? No, we're the church. We're the bricks that the brick church is made out of. We're being built up as a spiritual house. And every time we peck away at each other 
Every time we hurt each other and give each other a hard time, we're trying to pull somebody's brick out. And by the way, that's not all the harm you're doing when we do that. Because as we're pulling on their brick, we're loosening up our own too. Enough of that, and the whole structure starts getting shaky. Remember that we're the bricks. Matthew Henry, all true believers are a holy priesthood, sacred to God, serviceable to others. Does that sound a little bit like something I always say? Endowed with heavenly gifts and graces, but the most spiritual sacrifices of the best in prayer and praise are not acceptable except through Jesus Christ. Christ is the chief cornerstone that unites the whole number of believers into one everlasting temple and bears the weight of the whole fabric. So what's Mr. Henry saying? He's saying sacred to God, serviceable to each others. Serving him by serving each other. Christ is the chief cornerstone that unites the whole number of believers into the new temple, which is us. And without him, we have nothing. So in Romans, he says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship, your very body itself, your whole physical existence needs to be a sacrifice to God, needs to behave and be treated that way. And therefore, as imitators of God, as beloved children, walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Freedom carries with it a responsibility. Our commitment as individuals and as a church must be sincere and must be complete. This has to be a place where God's truth is upheld and proclaimed. And this is what we strive so hard to do from the pulpit every week that God's truth is upheld and proclaimed, and we don't get polluted by external forces, by bad doctrine, by unbelief, by corrupting influences. We must hold close to what Scripture has to say to us. It's important that we maintain the walls, the bricks that I was just talking about, which is maintaining each other. God's family must be guided, protected, and encouraged. There's a lot of things out there waiting to trip us up. There's a lot of people out there that would like to take us out. We've got to hold on, guide each other along, protect each other, and encourage each other. God's church exists for his glory, serving him by serving each other, as Matthew Henry said, sacred to God, serviceable to others. If we can spend our days here at the Brick Church doing these three things, how could we go wrong? How could we go wrong? This is a formula for success. So let's all remember, we're all unbound. The church of Jesus Christ is unbound. We are the church. We are the beneficiaries of this amazing, wonderful gift of Christ. Let's always remember that and help each other along the way. Brick after brick, God is building his temple. Foundation and his